see what we can learn from God this morning, right? Amen. Amen. Let's see. We'll walk out here a little different. Um, so we keep working with this idea of, okay, I want to follow God. I want to walk with God. Why do I so often not? You know, what, what is the work that pulls me away, pulls me from fellowship with Him, fellowship with other believers, fellowship with His Word? You know, what, what is it at work? And there's a lot of reasons, and down the road we'll probably touch on some of the other ones, but the main one that we've been sort of hovering on is what James talks about in chapter 1. And that's these desires that are at work within us, that the they, they are susceptible to temptation. And these temptations aren't sin. I mean, Jesus was tempted. But when we give in to these temptations, and we looked at a lot of the desires, you know, what, it, what desires did he play upon when he tempted Eve, or when he even tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, and we saw, you know, to meet our needs. There's nothing wrong with that. Provision, you know? God says work hard, right? Um, for pleasure, for wisdom, for acceptance, affirmation, identity, uh, these different types of desires they went through, and I'm not going to rehash them all, but um, in most of these have at least at the core a desire that God actually built into us. God wants us to be happy. And he said our joy should, you know, and our happiness, our love, it should be something drawing the world towards Him. Um, he wants our needs met. He promised us to meet them. Um, there's, you know, all wisdom. He wants us to be wise above, you know, gentle. Wise as sort of gentle as does, or however that verse, you know, goes. Just the Holy Spirit comes to lead us in all truth. But he gives us a way to do it, and it's always through him. You know, I was thinking about even the songs we were just singing, and I want to want him more. I want to be close. I want to lay it all at his feet. I want... And I have these other desires inside me that sometimes I see a conflict, but I also want this, or I want security, or I want whatever. And the lie that we buy is often that we could, that those are separate from that. And so we chase these false things that will never last when we should be chasing Him. And He says, in me, you will find those other things. You will find all truth. You will find wisdom. Seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness. I will take care of your needs. I know what you need. You know, these types of things. In my presence is fullness of joy. He says, I am the vessel. Why? Because he created us to live in relationship with him. You know, if we, if we look... Um, Marty, leave my notes. If we, <laughs> if we look, there's three places in the Bible where God's will is perfectly done. That I, I'm sure a little bit. The three biggies Genesis 1 and 2, the garden pre fall. The other end of the Bible, heaven, free of all sin, sickness, sorrow, death, and tears in his presence fully. And in the life of Jesus, who lived without sin. Who lived, he said, I won't speak a word unless the Father speaks it. I won't do anything unless the Father does it. I and the Father does it. I and the Father are one. And in each of those places, what are they marked by? An intimate, walking, living, close relationship with God. That's his desire for us. That's what we were created for. And so it makes sense he would not make any of these other things available, truly available, outside of him. Because he would then be encouraging us to actually walk away from him rather than towards him. And it's something for us to kind of be aware of because we have these desires and we have options to how to seek them. And the, the, again, the, that lie is I can choose to like give up my everything to God or I can choose to be happy or I can choose to take care of my needs or I, and he says, no, all of that in me is where it's found. And I came upon this passage, um, I'll read in a moment, but in another passage in James. And James, I was telling the guys at men's group, James is an amazing, practical, walking out faith book. It really is. You know, if you want to just be filled with joy and peace and understand that the joy of the Lord is possible, no matter what your circumstances, read Philippians. Short book, Paul's writing from prison, doesn't know if he's going to live or die, talks about joy and rejoicing all over the place, anxious for nothing. 
You want to kind of know about a walking, what is our faith supposed to look like in the world? Read James. Um, not saying exclusive from joy, all that's supposed to be a part of it. But when you read James, make sure you understand something. Because James is filled. Faith without works is dead. You know, true religion is widows and orphans. All of these nitty-gritty, hands, boots on the ground statements. Where you'll get in danger is if you think that those are to gain God's approval or to gain his love or to gain his salvation. That's why some didn't like James. They felt it was a workspace. It's not. It is saying as a result of salvation, of already being loved by God, of being adopted by God, that true relationship with God, if it is real, will produce these works. We do not do works to gain God's love or acceptance. We cannot earn it. The cross took care of it for us. He did what we could not do. But from that place, from a place of loving Him, being restored to Him, um, back in relationship, the overflow of that should be, I mean, as we meditate and dwell upon the grace and the forgiveness that has been shown us, that should start to flow from us to others. As we dwell on our security, adopted children of God, eternally sealed, nothing can separate us from the love of God, no created thing, that should start to give us a peace that the, the news of the world or the changing circumstances of life should not be able to ruffle as much as we start to just anchor in this eternity, fixing our eyes on things unseen, that this moment is but a moment, but eternity is ours with God, it should put things back in perspective. I and mean, it's not to say things that have happened here are not big, but in the scope of eternity there's a perspective. We can deal with things that are big on earth, but it shouldn't totally whack us out in the sense of just shatter our, our that peace that God says is available to us, which at times, I mean, just, I know for me, is very elusive. You know, there's times I do just get my cage rattled by stuff going on in the world or in my life or whatever, and I got a really, the only antidote I have found, and it's not to run into substance abuse, it's not to run into anything else, it's just to get into God's Word and re-anchor. And, you know, for me, Psalms has become one of the most precious books in the Bible. And guys, you may not like Psalms right now, because I know I sure didn't when I came to Christ. I was, I like the history books. David got his sword and cut off Goliath's head. And this army did that and all that. And Psalms was soppy love letters that girls read. But as I looked at very broken points in my life, well, I mean truly broken, and me or people around me, I started to look at the people in my life who just loved the Lord with the love I envied. And almost without exception, Psalms was the favorite book for them in the Bible. And I just started to open it. And you find in Psalms almost every emotion you will ever experience is expressed in at least one, if not multiple, Psalms. There's exuberant joy, there's fear, there's anger at God, there's praise that can't be contained, there's questions to God, there's feeling like you're forsaken by God. There's, uh, there's Psalm, you know, talk about, I can't go anywhere to flee from your presence. I mean, it's all, and often it's the same author, just at different seasons of life. Um, but all that being said, getting back, James is a really good practical book. You know, we talked, we took a detour a couple weeks for two Sundays and talked about memes and social media and all that the Bible says about guarding our tongue and weighing our responses and people are watching. We are the light. We're supposed to be the light, the salt, you know, these types of things. And where do you find the most famous passages practically about the tongue? James. You know, it's that match that ignites a fire. It's the tiny rudder that steers a ship. It's the bit that guides a massive horse. Um, James is really practical. And look at this, what it says about these desires we're talking about. James uh, 4, 1 to 5. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You're, you desire and do not have. So you murder, you covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and quarrel. 
You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Next screen, please. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do, and I love this last one. Or do you not suppose it is to no purpose, the scripture says, he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. You know, think about anyone that you truly loved, you gave your life to, you were joined to, a bride or bridegroom. Do you not yearn jealously over that? You know, when we, we read this friendship with the world, well, God's just a killjoy. God just doesn't want to have fun. We, I, we can't ask, you know, for ourselves or whatever, whatever. You can read that through lenses that are so negative and so, again, embracing that lie that happiness and God are separate. Play. You choose which one you want. It, it's not. And here's the reason. He doesn't want you to fall in love with this world. doesn't mean not to enjoy. He says he gives us good things to enjoy, but to, to, to love this world and the things of this world more than we love him. Why? He yearns jealously over us. He loves us. He wants our first love, just like we would want that from anyone that we've given our heart to. And it's just a beautiful passage, but here James is saying, what, what's going on with all this junk? It's these desires in you. These desires are driving you, and, and you can't have, so you, you start this and that, and, and then the things you do ask for, you know, you're just asking purely for yourself, not for relationship with me or my Lord or going, you know, and, and again, the enemy will whisper, he just doesn't want you to have fun, you're just some cosmic chess piece that your only purpose on earth is just so that he gets glorified, you just, whatever happens to you, happens to you. And, and these lies that we buy, that we can somehow be filled with happiness and joy outside of the purpose we were created for, which was to live in relationship with Him. And this isn't just, oh yeah, I said some prayer and received, you know, yes, do you believe Jesus died on the cross and rose on the third day for your sins? I do. Do you believe you go to heaven? Do you believe that? Yes, I do. Great, you're saved. Okay, that's it. Now go live like the world the rest of your, you know, however many years. But that's not what this is talking about when it says a relationship with God. You know, talking about walking with the Spirit in us and step with the Spirit and our life aligned with His, walking in the purpose um, of deciding, you're, you're my Lord, you're my Maker, and my place is going to be to walk with you as my rabbi, my teacher, and step with you. you know, I was listening to Bonnie and Paula this morning, and they were practicing before the service, and, and what I sensed was happening in one of your early songs, you were guys get to work together a little, is that one of you was trying to drop your voice to match the other, and the other was trying to raise, and you're doing, you know, and, and I, I thought of immediately when I was in the army, and you're walking and you're not in step, and so inevitably what would happen is both of you would correct at the same time. So now both of you are out of step, but you're in the other step out, and you always had to say, one person, you match me. And I would imagine, and, where you'd have to say the same thing. Okay, I'm going to hold this note, and you adjust to me, I would guess. Um, I know that's certainly the way of walking in step. And the Bible says, let us walk in step with the Spirit. And that doesn't mean, okay, God, I'm doing this so you catch up. That means, what's his step? Let me, let me click. Let me catch that. Do that half step, shutter step that brings you in, back in line, back on beat. And... It's something that I think, you know, we want to just really be careful of because these desires in us, they pull hard. And as we've been talking, what we really want is to be happy. I mean, really, if you think about it, it drives probably almost everything we do. The exception I can think of maybe would be, I mean, there's multiple. We just get to a place where we have no hope anymore and it just, you don't care, or we get to you know, other places, but, but the most, the core of most of what we do, and most of the reasons we walk away from God, is we want to be happy. And we feel like, well, if I'm secure, or if I'm affirmed by these people, or if I'm liked, or if I have my needs met, or if, 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 whatever it might be, then I would be happy. 
And we see it as a choice of either choosing God to surrender to God or choosing to pursue these things. And we've got to be so careful because this pursuit of happiness so often does not realize that God is probably the most joyful is. I mean, joy comes from God. He is the source. It is the fruit of the Spirit of God. And we've got to realize that it is only in His presence, only in closeness with Him, that we will truly experience the joy, the meaning, and the fulfillment we were created to walk in. There's, I'm not saying there's not counterfeits out there that will give us occasional bursts of euphoric happiness and things, but, but the steady, where we're not just living like this, but the steady, you know, you see those people you meet occasionally that are just steady. I mean, they, yeah, they have little bumps, but inevitably they're anchored to something much deeper. And, you know, what I, what I don't like is when I'm more like the wind-tossed waves on top of the surface. You know, it's like my anchor chain breaks and they're going, and I, I want to be anchored to that still water that runs deep. And so, yeah, the top buffets you a little, but never can take you against the rocks or that far away. And we, we've got to just choose to believe truths about God as revealed in his scripture, whether we feel it or not. You know, the quote from Tozer I used before, what comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. You know, if I see God as a distant, angry, mean God that just is waiting for me to mess up, I am never going to run to him for happiness. But if I realize he is the living water, the fountain of joy, the purpose I was created for, the one who delights in me, the one who has prepared for me eternity and died for me so that I could live in it forever, a place free of all sickness and sorrow and tears and death, the God that bottles my tears as they fall, the God who before the foundation of the earth knew every mistake and blasphemy I would make and utter every lust, every jealousy, every shortcoming, every selfishness, every laziness about me. I said, you know what, Eric, I love you so much, I'm still going to give you life. And I will absorb that on my back and in the thorns in my brow and in the nails in my skin on the cross because I want to be with you forever because I love you. That's the God we've got to know. Because if we don't realize that's who our God is, we are never going to go to Him for what only He can truly provide. And to worship and to believe these truths and to worship these truths and to sing songs of praise to these truths, even if we don't feel it, it's not fake, it's faith. The Bible says that we walk by faith, not by sight. And you know, I don't know about you guys, but so often I can stand back there during worship and if I come in and I've got irritation and insecurity and whatever, whatever, it's kind of harder to sing those songs because I don't feel them. You know? But it's not about that. It's about choosing in faith to speak and stand for what is true. And that's where it gets harder. To walk by faith and not by sight. But to choose that. To declare God is good when I don't feel like it in my life. But if I can't walk in that faith, then again, I will listen to these desires and I will run in other directions. And that's something that we just want to really guard against. And now, thinking you know, that we will be happier with this, fill in your blank, than with God, right, doesn't mean we don't believe in God. doesn't mean we don't love God. It doesn't mean, it just means there's something that we desire stronger than that relationship with God or some lie we believe that we, this is more important or this is found apart from God or whatever. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean we've rejected God wholesale, walked away into atheism. It just means there's some lies we're believing or some struggles we're having or some things that we aren't loving God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And it's pulling us into this split. And then we start to become that pendulum that's kind of like this, and we're not centered, and we're not steady. And that's when we can just have some trouble. And something that just, I want to clarify for a minute, because so much of our Christian teaching is what God will do for me. 
And, and honestly, the Bible offers us a million things, you know, He will do for us. I'm not saying it's bad. It's like some people say, well, I wouldn't want to serve God for treasure. That's selfish, you know. But yet Jesus says a lot about do this and your treasure in heaven and your rewards. It's He loves us. He, it's not unbiblical to say, give God your all. And from that, you will find joy and peace and all that. But if that's the only reason we'll do it for what we get, we've also missed that he is a holy creator, maker, king, and lord. And he is worthy of our worship and our faith, whether we see any results from it or not. We will. But he is worthy. And we have to be so careful not to turn him into the Santa Claus in the sky or the little, you know, what was that Jack in the Bar thing where you turn the wheel and nothing would ding, 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 and then pop up. You know, just kind of that vending machine God. And because of so, we have lost all sense of the holiness of God. God did not change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The God of wrath towards sin, of holiness who can stand nothing dark, no sin. The God who will not endure sin with him for eternity. But God has not changed. What change is in love. He said, I have offered you a way to be shielded from that. Because I love you, I will satisfy my own justice with my own son's life in grace and love. And what you read when you read the New Testament is you read the same, the God of the Old Testament through the lenses of grace, through the lenses of his love and his mercy and gentleness. And when we can do that, we realize, and then, you know, then we can say, I, I would be just as correct to say, you need to give God your all because he is God and you are not. That is absolutely true. Romans 12, you know, it is your worth, your reasonable sacrifice to present yourself as a living sacrifice before God. It is your reasonable praise and offering and sacrifice unto God. It's absolutely true. But so is what he says, that in me is fullness of joy. In me, fruit of my spirit, love, joy, peace, you know, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control. These things are in him. And he tells us that, and so we can share that as well. I, I found uh, really interesting, I was reading in Matthew, and I want to share this with you, um, starting with chapter 6. You do not have this, Carolyn. Um, in the context of this, what we've been talking about, I haven't quite seen this full passage this way. It starts with Matthew 6, 19. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your body will be full of light. This is Jesus speaking. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the other and the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And because we have put all these section breaks in the Bible. You know, when you do your little morning readings, you might stop there often. But Jesus did it. For you cannot serve God in money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? 
For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I was reading that, and it, I saw it in kind of a different way. You know, the treasure part, that's kind of obvious. What are the greatest treasures or desires of your heart? You know, what is it you want more than you want anything else? You know, don't store up treasures on earth where moths eat them and thieves steal them and rust destroys them. He said, store up the treasures that are eternal, those things that cannot be taken away, those things that will cross that line with you and endure for eternity. These desires, these treasures, you know, what would be a great question this week as we take time alone with God. Lord, show me. Holy Spirit, reveal to me what are the treasures of my heart? What do I desire more than anything? You know, what is it? Remember Jesus told a parable, um, Matthew 13, 44, you have that, Carolyn. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up, Then, in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, kingdom of heaven is not simply you die and go to heaven. We have so watered down the gospel, this good news of great joy. What is a kingdom? It is a king's domain. It is where the domain, the will of a king is done. You know, I say all the time, a king can look across that ocean or the channel, king of England, and he can look at those shores of France and go, man, I want those. Those are part of my kingdom. But until he can exert his will over that, it's not his kingdom, it's his wish. A kingdom is where the will of God is done. And Jesus said the kingdom of God is in our midst. It is within us. When you surrender your life and you live your life and the will of God dominates your life, when he lives as king in your life, you are the kingdom of God on earth. Remember said of his government, of the increase of his government, there'll be no end. As believers increase on the earth, as people surrender their hearts to God, the kingdom of God is expanding. The reign and rule of God in our lives, over all parts of our life, is expanding. He said it's like a treasure hidden in the field, which of such joy you would go and sell all that you have. That's what he said it's like if you truly can discover what he is offering to live with him as our king. You know, I like the other gospel called the kingdom of God. I think I like that better because the kingdom of heaven, it just makes it like, but he says here now. Remember, remember how he taught us to pray. You know, you are our art, art in heaven, holy, hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what we pray. That's what we walk around. That's what we seek to bring to this earth. When we give people encounters, affirmations, words, pray for them for healings, when we pray the demonic deliverances, whatever it might be, there's none of that up there. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth now as it is in heaven. There's our commission. Remember, it's not just suffer and clench your teeth and grit your teeth and try not to screw up here on earth till one day he takes you to heaven. No, when that Jesus was born, what did they say? Behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be unto all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David the Savior, which is Christ the Lord. The Lord, our King. The invitation to live with God is reigning and ruling over our life is one that if we understand, we will sell all, all treasures of the earth for that. Okay? And so then what does he roll into? Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious. The implication being, when we get so worried about our needs, one of those targeted desires we saw the enemy plays against, what do we tend to do? We tend to invest in earthly treasures. We tend to store up because we have fear. Now, this doesn't mean we're not to be good stewards. It doesn't mean we're not. But when that becomes our security and our trust greater than he is, 
when we would have less peace with nothing in the bank than we would with a million dollars, we'd have our trust in the wrong place. Because our God has not changed. And He loves us no less. And so that's why it, we've got to be careful. And it's really interesting, this eye is the lamp of the body. It's kind of like, huh, that is like a really weird, you know, did the teleprompter go off there on the Sermon on the Mount? You know, it's, it's like he kind of goes off track here for a minute, but he's not at all. There, there's a, uh, bring up Matthew 20, 15, please. Jesus is telling the parable of the, the workers that go out and, and the guy, the master hires the ones early in the morning agrees upon a wage and pays them the wage all day. And then he hires some a few hours later and then some a few hours later. At the end of the day, he goes and he pays them all the same. And the ones that were hired in the morning are all angry. They're all just bitter because we worked three times as long and got the same. And he's like, what is that to you? Did I not pay you what we agreed upon? And is this not mine to give and do with as I wish? And in this translation, am I not allowed to do what I choose what belongs to me, or do you begrudge my generosity? It is interesting. Other translations will say, is your eye evil because I am good? Are you seeing this in a way that is evil? Has, has your anger at me, your sense of injustice, caused you to see this wrong? Is your eye evil because I am good? How are you seeing this? What are you seeing that is of value? What do you see? What is the greatest that you see of value, Christian? Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, but in eternity. If the eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. And how great that darkness would be. If you see that of this world as your greatest treasure, then how dark it's going to be inside. But if you see that of eternity and the things important to your Father's heart as your greatest treasure, then your eye will not be dark. You will not see that which is good as bad. You will see what is of true value. And He knows the danger of our needs and he just rolls straight in, therefore I tell you. And I've never seen that connection, I think because of that little verse break we put in. I've never seen, it wasn't until I was reading it in a harmony of a stereotyped gospels that merges them all and has no breaks. And I went, who? You know, it was like he rolled straight into this, the treasure, seeing things just wrong, straight into being anxious, you know, and, and, and trying... He says, don't worry about your needs. Seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness, and these will be added unto you. And this goes over and over of these things that he offers us. The joy in your presence is fullness of joy. Wisdom, my Holy Spirit in you will lead you into all truth. Identity, affirmation, nothing can separate you from my love. My Holy Spirit in you is the seal of your adoption as my child. The, the, my son's flesh, the veil you pass through, gives you confidence to come into my presence at all times. It's, it's a pretty neat thing when we start to say, and I don't know if I'm bringing it quite together, and if not, I apologize. It's sometimes hard to capture those things that are so alive in you and get it out of the words accurately, but that I, what do we see and how do we see it? What do we see as the greatest treasure? What do we see of the greatest value? And so I would encourage us to, this week, as we walk out this door, as we spend this week with God, say, Lord, Holy Spirit, help reveal to me those treasures and help reveal to me how I see these things. I want an eye that is good, not evil. I want to see things through your eyes, God, through your perspective, through your weight. You know, that which is so big to me, either like as a desire or really big bad news or whatever, let me see it through your eyes. Let me see it through your eternal perspective, Lord. Let me see it through your heart. 
You know, I often would pray, give us a heart that weeps over what yours weeps over and rejoices over what yours rejoices over. We want your heart, God. And it doesn't always line up with our heart of the world. But when it lines up with his, it will be true. And that the thing we read from C.S. Lewis last week, that, you know, it's not that our desires are bad, it's that they're too small. You know, as he equated to the child who has no idea of what it means to be offered a trip to the seashore, and because they have no concept of the seashore, they prefer to stay and play in the mud puddle in the slums. Because they can't, you know, they're like, they're okay there. Like, you don't, do you understand what's being offered to walk with God? And surrender and now the fruit of the Spirit fill us his joy his peace but it takes faith it takes choosing to trust his words even when we don't see them coming true for however long that might be but it says no my God has said this and that's in context, that's with the precepts, not taking them out of context, and just, you know, it's truly knowing what his promises are, who they're for, what they mean, and what he lays. But to be blessed. You know, pick up next week, God willing, with just revisiting those beatitudes, but Sometimes the other thing I would encourage you to read, go back and read the Beatitudes. And realize, just, just replace the word, if it's not in your translation, the word blessed with happy. And see how shallow that is. How fleeting. And how often it doesn't apply. Happy, you know, as he were persecuted, reviled, uttered evil against him. You know, I mean, we could be in the sense of, wow, we're being used for God, but... There's something so much deeper in that word, blessed. And it's, it's, I think, King James and others, out of 44 times it's used in the New Testament, it's, uh, out of 50, 44 times it's translated blessed, and only six happy. But yet, some people so casually use it, happy in the one, happy. No, blessed. Blessed in a far better place, something so much deeper. And what are each of these? The poor in spirit, the mo those who mourn, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, persecuted for righteousness' sake, blessed. It may hurt, there may be tears, but blessed when you are right. When you have the kingdom of heaven or of God, you will be comforted. You will inherit the earth. You'll be satisfied. Receive mercy. See God called sons of God. Great is your reward in heaven. We'll look at that a little more. But just, just look at that sometime. Go read Psalm 1. You want to know what blessed is like? Go back and read Psalm 1. I'll just read it to you quick and we'll end it here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Well, what does the blessing look like? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. He is like a tree planted by streams, drinks deep. And it's important we remember, in its season, we have seasons of bearing great fruit, we have seasons of waiting, we have seasons where we just feel so close to God, and seasons when we don't. In all of them, He is with us, He loves us, He is growing us, He is working all things to good. In all of them, at times, it's more evident than others. But to be, you know, I was telling Marianne as we were coming home the other day on Interlake, and I'm like, wow, look how many trees are starting to get the fall yellow already. Mm -hmm. oh, 
when was the last time they had any rain that reached the bottom of their roots? I mean, the water table, it's, you know, it, it's, it's pretty scary when you don't have that water table to drink from. And you all start to show, you know, fake flat fall colors. And we all start to show the beating, the wear and tear. Blessed. 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 That word is so much deeper. It is drinking. It is anchored. It is close. It is that deep to deep. It is that union between you and the Spirit of God that walks. And how it honors our Father when we walk in that when we don't feel a thing. You know, when, when, it, when you tell a child, you ask a child to do something or tell them to do something, and they don't go, why? Or, what do I get? Or, whatever. But they just go, okay. Even when they don't understand, they're like, okay. They trust. They trust your love. They trust you care for them. They trust your wisdom. How we honor our Father when we do that. Blessed. God is offering us something so much bigger than happy. The way the world puts it. Blessed. Anchor to the deep. A joy and a peace that is far harder for the world to ruffle. And in that we will find our desires either melt away or they are fulfilled in ways bigger than we ever could have hoped for. But it's in Him. In Him. Not some prayer we said at Hume Lake 20 years ago. In a living daily relationship. He is the bread of life. And there is a reason they wouldn't let him collect manna more than for the day they needed it in the wilderness. Yesterday's bread might sustain you for a bit, but it's not going to be that what you live on. Sunday morning church service might give you a high for Sunday afternoon and maybe Monday morning, but it is not going to carry you through this week in this world. You need to drink from the well of God devour his scripture, fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Stay strong. But what we are offered is so good. It is so good. And he is so worthy. All right, Father, I thank Carol. you for this. Yes, Carol? Yes. Oh, I'll, let me pray while they're coming up to the music. Father, thank you for this morning and you love I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for your words, Lord. And I ask for the, to help us with the faith to choose to stand on them when we feel it and when we don't. Thank you for your goodness, Father. Thank you for the peace and the joy you make available unto us. I ask you, Holy Spirit, through this week to protect us. I ask for your angelic host to guard us, Father. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead us into divine appointments and help us to be sensitive and tender to your still quiet voice, be it for us or for others through us. I ask that you help us to narrow our focus, that you would be the heartbeat of our heart and our life. And that from that, all else would come and get done. Again, go ahead of those needing procedures this week, Father, and bless them. Put peace and healing and miracles upon them, Lord. And I thank you and ask this in Jesus' name.